Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Christina Archipolo, and I am our student and alumni engagement coordinator here at the FSU Alumni Association. Thank you for joining us, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our Demystifying Admissions webinar. For many students, the Florida State University experience begins long before their first day on campus, and preparation for college applications starts as early as freshman year of high school. As a preeminent university, recently surpassing 60,000 first-year applications for admission, we are so excited to partner with the Office of Admissions at FSU to provide an inside look into the undergraduate admissions process. To start us off tonight, I'd like to introduce our presenter for tonight, Hega Ferguson, Director of Admissions at Florida State University. Originally from Norway, Hega has received both degrees from Florida State, a Bachelor of Arts in International Affairs, and a Master of Arts in Social Sciences. Working her way up from student employee, Hega has been an advocate and servant of Florida State Admissions for 27 years. We're so thankful for her willingness to share her expertise with us and join us tonight. Hega, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for that kind introduction, Christina, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna have a fun time talking about admissions, specifically admissions for first year students or, or freshmen as we used to uh, call them. Um, you know, when I first came to Florida State, I never in a million years would have thought that my journey would take me to be a director of admissions at one of the top 20 public universities uh, in the US. And so, you know, you never know, right? Um, you know, what major you put on the application is not necessarily what you're gonna end up as, as a career. And I think um, that certainly says something uh, for my journey, but it has been a fantastic experience, both as a student and then later as a, as a staff member. And, you know, this is, this is what I love. I I love to uh, be able to talk with, with students and their family members uh, and being part of that journey of finding their next uh, home, you know, home away from home. And um, that is always such a very special experience. And so I'm excited to be here tonight um, to be able to share with you some of the things that uh, we hear um, in the college world and kind of demystify some of the things that we know is not necessarily the, the truth. Um, so what we want to do is to make sure that we are getting our next slide on. So can we just hang on for one minute? All right, this is kind of what I wanted to start with you as a, as a sort of a, a starting point. You know, when people ask me about Florida State and, you know, what are some of the things that we want to know about FSU, there are so many different things to choose from. But you know, the things that I'm pointing out here are things that um, I think is important for everyone to look at, at the different colleges and universities that you are considering. Um, certainly for FSU, having a 95% retention rate is something that is, uh, you know, puts us in the, in the top 10% in the country. And what the retention rate means is, is the number of students that are starting in their first year of college and then returning for their second year. And we know that there's so many changes and things that happened um, in, in that year. And so coming back uh, to continue their college experience for, of course, is, is super important. But also take notice of FSU having the number one four-year graduation rate in the state of Florida. And so a lot of that goes towards the things that FSU do really very successfully. And that is making sure that we are picking the right students and then we are setting them up for success when they are coming to Florida State. You may have heard, yes. I'm so sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but we're not seeing your slides in the You're moment. You're not seeing my slide? No, can you make sure you're sharing screen at the bottom? Yeah, it shows the sharing screens, but let me put you back here. Do you see it Maybe now? Maybe stop and start again if you see an option to stop sharing screen. Ah, do you see? I think we're that? almost there. Almost there? Let me. Yes, I see first year application numbers. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so yes. did you see any of these slides at all? No, we did not. Okay, well, get to see the beautiful flowers, get to see all the things, well, some of the things that I talked about, but I, I want to get you into this with the first year application numbers. Oh, uh, go and, away again. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And so, um, you know, what we have, have seen, and you probably have heard this from uh, former President Thrasher talking about um, the record number of applications uh, that Florida State has, has been receiving. And so here is what you see throughout the years, how there's been this quite dramatic increase in applications. And while 2021 is not listed here, we actually ended up with more than 66,000 applications, which consider that we are in, you know, in a pandemic still um, is, is, was not something that we would have imagined. But it really does speak to, you know, FSU's having a national uh, reputation. So, you know, far beyond what we're looking at in, in the state of Florida. I wanted to share this with you as well. This is the, the data for this class that we just brought in. And so when we are um, reviewing our applications and we are making our admissions decisions, as you can see from the middle fifth in terms of GPA and test scores, um, very, very talented students. And I know I hear often from, from some of my former friends that now have sending their students to college um, that indicating that, oh my gosh, you know, I don't know that I would have been admitted to Florida State. Well, we really have changed our profile quite a bit. And so once again, speaking to, you know, those really qualified students wanting to come to Florida State because what we offer as a university. There's so much more that we look at as part of our application review process. And so, you know, we want to be sure that we are representative of the population in the state of Florida. And you'll see there, we say 66 counties, and I may have somebody on here saying, Haga, hey, there are 67 counties in the state of Florida. And I'm gonna say, yes, there is. And unfortunately, we were not able to admit anyone from Liberty County in Florida this year. Uh, Liberty County is actually one of the least populous counties in the state of Florida, uh, but that's something that we're working on. And so, you know, making sure that we have representation from our whole state is something that we want to be um, sure to take into consideration, but certainly the whole country. Uh, we got students admitted from all our 50 states in, in the country. And uh, while it's not on this slide, had 49 different countries. So not only do we have a great national reputation, we also have a great international reputation. I want to draw your attention to a couple of things on the slide that I think is important. You see that 63% of our students that were admitted had all A and B grades. It's important to keep that in mind because for us, the performance in the classroom in high school is the best predictor of success in college. And so it's not just having A and B grades, but the expectation that the student is earning A and B grades um, in courses that are rigorous. So that means AP classes, honors classes, dual enrollment courses, perhaps IB courses, ACE courses, et cetera. Whatever the school offers in terms of a more rigorous academic curriculum, that's what we want to see. Don't, however, mistake that by thinking that as a student, the student needs to be taking, you know, nine AP classes um, in, their, in their senior year. Uh, that's not what we are looking for. We're really looking for the student to be able to challenge them within what will make them successful, not compared to everybody else. Also, the other thing that I think is important, advanced math. You know, I was not a math person, but I will tell you that, you know, coming to Florida State, you are expected to be able to take two math courses here, regardless of your major, unless you are coming in with some type of acceleration mechanism. And so 50% of our students 
came in with an advanced level math course the equivalent to calculus or higher. So once again, it's another subject that we are looking at that we find that the more exposure to math that you have in high school, the better success you will have with that subject here at Florida State. And see, we look at that in all the different areas. And so you see on the right-hand side, you will see in the garnet colored, that is what is the minimum that you have to have in order to be considered for admission to any of the 12, the 12 public universities in the state of Florida. The turquoise color, is what we have as the average for our accepted students. So having just the minimum for graduation from the high school is not gonna put you in a competitive setting at Florida State. So that's something you, you definitely wanna take into consideration. So for us, there's a lot of different focuses that we have in terms of um, determining what our class is going to be like. But our focus really from FSU that has contributed to a lot of students wanting to apply to FSU is making the whole application process as easy and as simple as possible. And so for FSU, we have three different application platforms that the students can use. And so the institutional application is the application that has been with FSU forever in a day. And so that still remains. It's not paper though, it's all online. We also uh, take application for the coalition and we also accept the common application. In fact, almost 80% of our students will submit an application through the common application. The common application have close to a thousand members. And so what makes this so easy for the students is that students complete that one application and then they can send it out to all of the other institutions that are also part of the common application. So again, you can kind of see how that is easier for students as they are filling out their applications. The other things that we have done is that we have included an opportunity for students that qualify for application fee waivers to be able to uh, indicate that as part of them filling out the application. So application fee waivers are for students that are um, typically in uh, free and reduced lunch, in a TRIO program, et cetera. And so in the past, these students would have to go to their guidance counselor to um, get a paper form, and then they have to send that paper form to us. Well, you know, that's, as you can imagine, uncomfortable for students to have to go and ask for one of those forms. So we incorporated on all of our applications an opportunity for the student to check off what they qualify for in terms of a category for an application fee waiver. And so by checking one of those options there, the application fee is automatically waived. And so for underrepresented and disadvantaged students, obviously this removed quite a bit of a barrier. And so that was something else that we found was really very helpful. And typically we have about 20% of our students will be applying with an application fee waiver in, in an academic year. Another thing that we have added was self-reported student academic transcript or SAR as we call it. And this has really just for us been revolutionary because, you know, receiving 66,000 applications and receiving paper transcripts for all of those students is just a logistical nightmare. And if you didn't know, uh, Florida has a reputation of having some of the worst high school transcripts in the country. So what we were able to do uh, several years ago is we were able to participate in the self-reported student academic record, which allows the students to take their official high school transcript and then report the data exactly as it is on the high school transcript through a web form. So we're collecting the data showing 
that they have, you know, this is the name of the course, this is the type of rigor, is it an honors AP class, is it a year long course, um, all of that data we are then collecting. And so again, because there's so many of us in the state of Florida that are using this, the students only completed once, and then they are able to send it out to a multitude of institutions. So less work for the students, more efficient for us at the university level. And uh, frankly, it's standardized tra transcripts for us. So we are actually able to dig in and get a lot of information from the uh, transcript that had been submitted that helps us in shaping the class and deciding uh, what our priorities are going to be um, in, in selecting our students. And then lastly, um, self-reported test scores. Uh, we are allowing students to self-report their test scores at Florida State. So again, they're using their uh, score reports and reporting all the test scores that they have taken. And so that allows us to be able to get test score information immediately. We don't have to worry about test scores being lost or coming in late and not meeting deadlines, et cetera. And when they get new test scores, they're able to just log in through their application status check and be able to self-report their test score. Now, I know there's probably gonna be some of you out there that worry perhaps about students and if they are providing us with the correct information. And so I will tell you for the self-reported student academic record, in any given year, uh, we typically will rescind an offer of admissions um, for students that did not do so well in their senior year. Um, and as part of our conditions of admissions, we tell students that we must receive their official transcript before they enroll at Florida State. And we will take that high school transcript and we will look to make sure that it matches exactly as what they reported. And so when we are looking at that information for the past four years now, that I've had less than five students every year that we have rescinded an offer of admissions based on the self-reported test score compared to students who offers of admissions we rescinded for receiving grades below a C, which is typically in the range of about 70 to 100 students. So all in all, students are very honest with us. And so that of course is something that lends itself to making sure that this process is working as effectively as it has been for us. But a lot being able to making sure that we are using self-reported information. So I wanted to share with you, you know, we hear time and time again, um, what is it that the colleges look at? And I will tell you that, you know, colleges have their own institutional priorities. So there are going to be slight variations of what they're going to prioritize. Um, some of that is going to depend on the size of the class that they're bringing in. Um, it also is going to depend on, you know, what the university feel is really important. But what we hear time and time again is that extracurricular is something that is really very important, um, certainly essay, et cetera. And so I think it's important that we take the time to kind of address some of those things and making sure that you know really truly what we are looking for. And so when you look at this slide, this is a really good representation of what we call holistic review. And that means all of these factors, all of them will play some type of importance in the application evaluation area. So when people come and say, you know, you must have this GPA or, or this test score, or, you know, if you have um, been able to be the president of the student government, you know, that's a shoe in, I I'm here to tell you, that's just not the case um, because, you know, while grades and test scores are some of the best indicator of success in college, 
there are lots of other things too that we want to make sure that we are taken into consideration. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that we are looking at uh, all the different factors that's going to help us make sure that students are be successful at Florida State as well as being a good fit. So, for us, as we start every year, there are things that our administration will tell us, you know, this is something that is going to be really important. And so uh, one of those things, for instance, will be the size of the class. So every year I'm given a number that our administration says this is the number of students, first year students, that we want to make sure that you're bringing into the university. And then we have to also make sure that how we evaluate students, that that also is in accordance to meeting our, our different types of metrics, that's performance metrics, um, and as well as, as making sure that meeting the institutional goals of the university. And so generally speaking, as part of our holistic review process, we break it down into roughly four different areas. The academics, by far the most important factor that we're gonna be able to look at. And so when people say to me, you know, what is the minimum GPA and test scores that I have to have to get admitted to Florida State? In some ways, that's almost like nails on the chalkboard for me, because it's just, we're not talking about meeting the minimums. We're really talking about how has the student um, been able to challenge themselves in their curricular setting? And how do we know based on that, if they're gonna be a good student at Florida State? Are they gonna be a good fit a student at Florida State? And so for that, we are looking at what are the courses have been taking, what were the grades obtained, what was the rigor? What does the senior schedule like? Sometimes students forget that when you're applying to college, we are looking at the grades from ninth through 11th grade. It doesn't mean that 12th grade is not gonna be important, but we are not gonna have those grades as we are making our decisions. The assumption, however, will be that you are continuing to do as well as you have done in prior years. So grade trend is an area that we would look at. You know, did you start out a little slower as, as you entered into high school, but has since just taken off and done really well? Or is it the opposite, where in your junior year, you are now starting to struggle and some C's are, are popping up, maybe even a D. Well, those are things that are gonna ra ra raise some red flags with us that we would be concerned about. Test scores as well. Um, you know, for test scores, and, and we'll probably talk about this a little later, uh, last year, Florida was the only state in the country that requires an SAT or an ACT. It is not an institutional choice for FSU to require test scores. It's actually a Florida Board of Governors requirements and admissions regulation that mandates that students applying to any of the 12 public universities, they must have an ACT or SAT test score. And so that was a requirement last year. Um, it is a requirement this year. The two only states again this year is, is going to be, uh, Georgia is going to be joining us. And so Florida and Georgia will all require test scores as part of the admissions process. And test scores, what's important to know about that, you know, there is really no limit um, for how many times that you can take it. But, you know, I would say anything more than three, statistically speaking, we tend to not see any big jumps with that. And so the one thing that you wanna do is in preparation for taking a test score, just making sure that you don't go in and just take it blind as some students say. You know, if it's been a while since you took geometry, you probably wanna freshen up on that a little bit. Same thing with algebra. If it's been a while, you may want to go ahead and freshen up on that. Just preparing yourself for taking a test score. But again, you know, it is not gonna be just a GPA and a test scores. There's gonna be lots of other factors as well. 
the essay. And that's usually something that will come up as, you know, what should I write my essay about? And I, I saw an article um, earlier today that talked about, you know, what are some of the things that we should be avoiding? And I actually had a conversation with a young man earlier this week as well. And we talked about, you know, what is it that you should be uh, writing about in your essay? And the truth is, is it's not so much about necessarily what you write about, but it's how you write it and how we present information about you. So as we are reviewing your application, we really are there to want to learn more about you, you as a person, you behind the grades, the test scores, behind the application. So, you know, choose to do an essay that really allows us to learn more about you. Uh, once again, just trying to learn and understand if you think you, if we feel that based on this information, you would be a good fit for our university. Resume or a list of activities, it does not have to be in a resume format, is another thing that we are looking at. Um, I will say that once again, there really is no list over these are the things that you should be including on your list of activities. Um, same thing as, you know, there is uh, a minimum or a maximum number. Um, you know, generally speaking, when we look at our students here at Florida State, this is an engaged group of students. They're active, they like to be involved, but they are also very diverse. And so that means we have students that are really involved in the community, uh, volunteering, but we also have students that like to do club sports, a student government, guitar players, you name it. Um, we have more than 700 clubs and organizations at Florida State. And so it's important for us that we are able to match students um, at Florida State who, who's really fitting into that, that want to be able to do that, but also recognize that we are going to have thousands of students. They're going to have similar things. And so what we are wanting to see are students that have um, participated in an activity over perhaps longer period of time. And so as a good example, for instance, is when I have student athletes, my swimmers. And so, you know, it's because of the time commitment, it's probably not realistic that they're going to have swimming and 10 other activities on their list over things to do. And that's okay, that's not the expectation. Again, we want it to be more a reflection of what the student is wanting to do as opposed to what they think they should put on their list of activities. I think you're gonna be a much happier person pursuing those things that you have an interest in instead of trying to figure out what it is that we at the college level is, is looking at. And then finally, um, we do look at the high school that you are, are attending. We look to see what are the curricular offerings um, that's available at, at the high school. And so we don't really compare the students to the high school down the road. Uh, we're really more concerned about what is the student, how is the student performing in their current setting? And so that is definitely something that, you know, as we are trying to understand the performance of the students and how they continue to challenge themselves, um, that is something that we will take into consideration. So as you can tell, lots and lots of different types of, of things that we're looking at. I touched on briefly, you know, the SAT or ACT being a requirement for this year as well. I do also want to point out the super scoring is really important. And I always tell students, you know, this is sort of like the, the, the gift, if you will, the, for students that are retesting, is that the super scoring allows us to take the highest earned ACT or SAT subscores to make a new total SAT score or a new ACT composite score. So in other words, there's really, there's no penalty for you to taking the test score several times. And, and I do get questions about, you know, do you look to see how many times I took your test score? 
no, I don't. Um, I'm really just more interested in how did you perform on your test score um, instead of seeing how many times that the student had taken it. These are some of the myths that I thought was, you know, important that we, we try to, to address. And some of them I have already, you know, been able to share with you. You know, this whole thing about uh, college is hard to get into. And, and we read every year about the, the student that was admitted to, you know, a hundred different colleges that getting all the different types of scholarships. Um, and, you know, I would hope that you're not applying to 100 different colleges, because to me, I just don't think that there would be 100 different colleges that I would be interested in. But the vast, vast majority of students are going to be able to go to a college. It may not be their first choice, depending on what college it is, but they are going to be able to go to college. And so I would say, what is important for you to do right now as part of your preparation is coming up with a list of colleges that you have an interest in. And then you do your research in finding out in, in what it is that they're looking for in terms of, of grades and test scores. And so very often you'll see the middle 50th uh, range listed. And so when you see that, you will see that, you know, that is the middle 50 of their, their admitted students. And so that means there is a, a top 25 that's a, above that, but there's also a bottom 25 that's below that um, as what the middle 50th. And so you want to be sure that you are uh, coming up with a list of schools where you feel you're compatible. Uh, I think that's really important to kind of keep in mind. And then you visit and you can do that now. Just about all colleges have virtual tours of their campus. It's no substitute for visiting colleges in person, but it's a great opportunity to just learn about colleges early on. So um, I think that would be a, a, a great starting point. But this whole idea that, you know, you're not going to get into college, that's just the myth. They are thousands of colleges that are wanting students, that need students. Um, it's just a very, very, very small um, group of, of colleges and universities like the Harvards, but those are like 2% of all colleges uh, where they're talking about, you know, having a 3% a acceptance rate, et cetera. So, so keep that in mind. Um, the other one I think is, you know, it's a mistake to get creative with your essay. Well, that kind of depends. You know, if you're taking the essay and you decide all of a sudden that, you know, you're going to just make some jokes, et cetera, or being sarcastic, um, that's a bit of a risk because maybe you're not that funny or maybe that is just not my sense of humor. And so you kind of have to think a little bit about the person that is gonna be reading uh, the essay. So I always tell students that, you know, creativity can be a wonderful thing, but I would make sure that you have someone read your essay, different types of people that read your essay to make sure that your creativity is, is applied appropriately. And so, you know, something to, to kind of think about. Same thing with, you know, have someone else read your essay. Um, and I would tell you that if you're choosing to personalize your essay by putting the name of the institution in the essay, chances are you're applying to several colleges and universities, which we expect you to, but you do have to make sure that you change the name of the institution in your essay to make sure that it's matching with the application because every year uh, we always see those essays that have like the wrong name of the institution in there. We kind of chuckle. It's not, it's not because we don't think that you're applying to different colleges, but it really tells us that did you take that extra time to look over all the information before you submitted it to us? And so, you know, take your time, follow instructions, making sure that you are doing everything that we're asking you to. And I will tell you that 
while some of the questions on the application may seem a little silly to you, um, we are asking those questions for specific reasons. And so do make sure that you take the time to um, you know, answer every one of those, um, those questions that are on there. The last one that I'm just gonna uh, touch on is, you know, colleges want well-rounded students. Um, and can I just say, I really have come to just really not like well-rounded because what does that really mean, you know? And so it's one of those words that we kind of throw around there, but it really doesn't, it doesn't really give much of a content. And so I, as we are looking through students' application, I just want to learn more about you, you as a person. And I don't want you to worry about, you know, what is a well-rounded student. We have expectations of, you know, how you're challenging yourself academically and personally. And all in all, we're gonna review all of that information and making a decision or determination if we feel that FSU is a good fit for you as a first year student. You may not know, and I think these are really important things to keep in mind. Admissions criteria are not the same from year to year. They may vary because maybe one year the administration tells me, hey, I want you to bring in 6,000 freshmen. The following year, they could say, I want you to bring in 7,000 freshmen. Well, you know, the way that it works you don't admit just 6,000 or just 7,000 because in some ways we operate like the airlines do because you've applied to several institutions. And so you'll get acceptances from several institutions. And so now comes the all important decision-making process. So I always know that we are giving more acceptances than, than we are anticipating having because they're students they're going to elect to go elsewhere. But with a larger class, that means we have a little bit more flexibility than if we have a smaller class, particularly when you look at that in lieu of the large applicant pools that we have. The truth is we have many more very well qualified students applying for admissions to Florida State than what we have spaces for. But I say that, and I think it's really important to point out, there are so many different ways of coming to Florida State. It's not just as an incoming first year student starting in the summer and the fall. In fact, because we've had so many very well qualified students applying, we uh, adopted a program a few years ago called the Seminole Pathways Program. And that program is for students that did not meet our summer or fall admissions profile. However, they were still very good students academically. And so those students were given four options to choose from they could either go to another state college and take five classes and make A and B grades in specific courses that we tell them to take and then come to FSU in January as a transfer student. We also had spaces available on the Panama City campus. And so students could go there, stay there for one year and then transfer to the Tallahassee campus after a year or they could stay at the FSU Panama City campus and graduate from there. We also have international offerings. And so our international programs allow students to do a semester abroad. And so students were given an opportunity to go to either one of our four study centers in London, Valencia, uh, the Republic of uh, Panama and uh, Florence. In the fall and then transition back to the Tallahassee campus in January. Some students opted to do a full year abroad. So their first freshman year, they went abroad. And so those students will be gone fall, spring, summer, and then coming to the Tallahassee campus as sophomores um, at the university. So that's an example of a program that we've developed. 
we work with a number of students to be able to transfer to the university after one semester. And then there's also a number of students that are earning an AA degree and then transfer to the university. I can confidently say that if a student really want to graduate from FSU and, and, and looking to apply as a first year student but was not granted admission, we can find and create a pathway for that student to be able to at some point join us at Florida State and eventually graduate with a diploma from FSU. And so that's something that's really important to us and uh, something that we continue to do makes us uniquely different. I will tell you that there is not a lot of other institution and definitely not in the top 20 public universities that offer that as an opportunity. But I think that speaks to who we are as an institution as well. So as you are preparing for this whole crazy world of, of admissions, uh, what are some of the things that you should be preparing for? read your emails. We will send you tons and tons of emails and not just for Florida State, it's going to be from a lot of different colleges and universities. So in some ways, you probably wanna make sure that you create an email account specifically for the application process just because of the volume of emails that we will be sending you. Because not only is this the admissions process, but it's also financial aid and it's housing and it's student activities. And so there's lots and lots of things that we wanna share information with you about. Pay attention to deadlines. They are there for a reason. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we get everything from you by our deadlines so that we can start the process of reviewing our applications and getting your decisions. For Florida State, we give decisions. Um, we have a priority admission notification. So our priority deadline is November 1st this year. And so for those students that had a complete application by that time, they will receive an admissions decision on February the 17th. Our final application deadline is March the 1st, and we will start giving decisions for those students that submitted and completed their application after November 1st. They will get a decision typically towards the end of um, March. So making sure that you are paying attention to deadlines is going to be very, very important. Be thoughtful about the school that you're applying to. Again, you know, I talked about this earlier. There is no need um, to be able to have 50 schools that you're applying to. You know, come up with a list that you and, and your family members feel comfortable with. Do your research on them, making sure that it seemed to be a good fit in terms of how you performed in school, your test scores, the cost of attendance, the location, the major, all of those things that's part of your decision-making uh, process. Making sure that you continue to make good grades in your senior year. I will tell you some of the hardest phone calls that we have to make are to students, letting them know that they can no longer come to FSU because they do not meet the conditions of admissions of having a successful senior year. And so for FSU, that means any grades below a C in their senior year is subject to having their offer of admissions. And so uh, you wanna make sure that you don't fall into that category. And lastly, focus on the fit. Focus on, you know, when you go to a, a campus, is this a place where you see yourself? And often we, we, we talk about that feeling you get, that feeling inside when you step foot on a campus and you look around and you say, you know, I can see myself here. I can see this being my home for the next four years. Uh, I can see myself being part of that community. And I think lastly, and while it's not on the slide, I think it's really important, take the time to really enjoy the process of applying to college. It's such a special, special time that, you know, you want to make sure that you try to make this as stressless as possible. 
And I know that there's going to be some family members in here that will probably say, well, that's easy for you to say. You're sitting on, on this side of the desk, so to speak. Well, I, I have a senior this year as well. So I'm a little familiar with the stresses that, um, you know, comes along with having a senior and applying to colleges. But again, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a joint venture. It's a journey where the student and the family members, this is your time to do it together. The students should be sort of steering this whole journey and the family members, you're a part of it and a very important part of it, offering advice, guidance, support when those time comes, when the students are feeling overwhelmed, stressed, et cetera. Um, but really try to make this as an, an enjoyable process as, as possible. And, and, and again, you know, just before we open up to, to questions, um, you know, this is just really an opportunity um, for us to learn about you. And so with everything that you're submitting to us, make sure that this is, this is really information that you think we should know about you because that is something that we would like to see. And, and I know often when I'm reviewing appeals, et cetera, students will say to me, but you don't know me. And I'll say, you're right, I don't, but you didn't mention this in, in any of the information that you provided to us, and, and I wish that you had. And so, you know, keep that in mind as you are preparing for the process of, of applying to, to colleges. So that was a lot. I probably went over my time because, you know, I can do that. Um, and uh, I wanted to share with you, this is my email address. Feel free to email me. I check my email um, probably too much, to be honest. And I respond to my own emails. And that is actually my direct uh, phone line as well. And I answer my own phone also. Best way to reach me though is actually via um, the uh, email address because I can check that from wherever uh, we are. So um, with that, Christina, I think we're ready to perhaps open it up to questions. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. If we were in person, I'd ask for a round of applause. So I just hope everyone is doing it behind their screens. Um, I see lots of people have started to use the Q&A feature, which is perfect. That is exactly where we will have y'all um, write your questions. So I will just go ahead and get started. Um, I will start with, we had a couple of questions about family members that attended FSU. So I think we have three of those. So I think we can kind of knock them out in one shot. So yeah. does the application include a question about family members that have attended FSU? Someone asked about that specifically in the common app, if you can um, indicate that yeah. and for a very similar question. So yes, does yeah. FSU take that into account and how can folks indicate that? Yeah, so um, that's what is being referred to as legacy. And that's a hot topic in college admissions. And I think most recently this spring, the California system uh, banned uh, being able to ask about legacy on an admissions application. And, and part of that is that in some way that disadvantages students, there are first generation and college students um, and somehow then disadvantaged. So we do not include that on our application for admissions, but I think we will, I think it's fair to say, we go out of our way to work with our graduates and their family members. And so, you know, it really is as simple as just giving us a call, you know, email me, and, and then we'll talk about it and see what we can do in the event that the student has not been offered admissions. You know, it kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier, having options. And I may not be able to offer admissions, um, you know, to, to the, the term and, and as a first year student, but I'm very often able to come up with an, an option that allows the students to come to Florida State sooner than later and eventually graduate from FSU if that's, if that's the goal. Hey, thank you. You know, this is a room of FSU alumni, so I'm sure a lot of people have that question, and now you yeah. have an avenue to communicate that, so that's perfect. Yeah. Our next question here, for 2022 graduates, are they competing with 2020 and 2021 graduates that may have taken a gap year? You know, I think that, that, that that's a great question, and I think a lot of people thought that that was going to happen originally, but that has not been the case. It wasn't the case for, you know, the, the 21 class. In fact, 
um, you know, very small percentage of students that opted to take a gap year that, that then applied for just, you know, regular admissions. So we don't really anticipate seeing that, but, you know, again, what we're going to look at is, well, if they took a gap year, what were they doing? You know, were they just sitting on the couch and, and you know, cable surfing or were they having a, an experiential learning experience? Um, there is a lot to be said for taking a gap year, to be honest with you. And in fact, in Europe, that's very common um, for students to take a break between their secondary school and before they go to, to uni university. And so, um, you know, we at FSU actually offer a gap year, a separate uh, gap year application program that our students can apply for. And so once a student has been admitted to the university, we will send out information to students to see if they would be interested in applying for a gap year and um, also offer some scholarships. We are one out of two uh, public universities in the country that support uh, gap year. And so UNC Chapel Hill is, is the other one and FSU is, is the, the next one. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question here, are you taking COVID into consideration for both grades and extracurricular activities? Absolutely. Um, that is one of the things that we feel like we have lived in this world of, of COVID for, for two years now, right? And so um, I almost kind of wonder what it's going to be like to look at applications not through the lens of COVID anymore, because COVID has impacted everyone in some sense or, or another. But, you know, we will have different experiences. So again, I think it's hugely important to share how COVID has impacted the student and, and sometimes their, their performance. I have, I, you know, I'm here time and time again, you know, I learned that I was not, you know, I didn't like online learning. I get it, um, you know, that's not my favorite way of learning either, but a lot of students had to do it. And so again, you know, what we're looking at and what we've seen is, is the uh, resiliency, the grit, um, and the initiatives that the students have taken to kind of, you know, be able to go through this pandemic that has impacted everyone. And we've seen that, for instance, when you talk about extracurricular activities, you know, there's a period of time where you couldn't do anything because you couldn't practically be outside. And so, you know, again, we were seeing students, you know, doing things like online tutoring and, um, you know, assisting other people in their community. And so, you know, it's really about, you know, you have this situation, what did you do with it? Um, and, and knowing that it is a challenge, because one of the things that we know is that you're coming to Florida State there's gonna be challenges here too. And so how are you going to be able to handle it? Are you gonna ask for help so that we can help support you? Or are you just not gonna say anything? And so again, it's sort of like that total picture, if you will. Definitely, thank you. So our next question, I had this question as well as a prepared question. So I wanted to ask, does a potential major stating a major affect admissions? And if you apply to a major, but don't get into that major, how does that impact your admission to FSU? That's a great question. We, we always every year see a lot of anxiety about majors. Like students think that, you know, you should put pre-med on there because, you know, you want to be a doctor and that looks great or lawyer or accountant, et cetera. Of our top five majors, um, an undecided, of course, is not a major, but it's an advising category. That was a third of our accepted students were undecided. And in some ways, that's much appreciated. To be honest, you know, these students are really telling us that there's a lot that you offer at Florida State, and I'm not <laughs> quite sure what I want to do. And that's for us then to say, that's okay. We have separate advising for you. So starting when you come for orientation, you are meeting with 
advisor that are specifically trained to be able to work with students that are undecided, making sure that they get on that track so that they can confidently declare their major by the junior year. Um, there are some major that will require you to do some additional things. And so particularly if you're looking at our performing arts programs, which would be including the College of Music, dance, it's film, it is studio art, theater, you know, particularly thinking BFA program here. Um, you know, those are some of those major that have actually a separate application as well. So it's a two-part process. One is that they are submitting the application for general admissions to the university that we are looking at. And then there is a separate application process with the specific program major that they will want to go into. And so, you know, what we will do is we will review those applications. We will tell the program, you know, these are the students that we would recommend uh, for admissions. And then these are the students that we are not recommending. And then we kind of go back and forth with some, some discussion as to, you know, they are allowed to advocate on behalf of some of the students. Um, and, you know, we come up to a, a, a good outcome, so to speak. Um, you know, when you are in a, a particular program like, let's say, film, chances are you are really passionate about film. So if you did not get admitted to the film program, um, can you change your major to undecided? You could, and we can, you know, we can take another look at your application. However, I'm going to be really honest with the student and the family members to say, you know, if you're thinking that you're just going to change that and then next semester be able to declare film, for instance, that is possibly not going to be an option at all. So what is the backup plan? And so I think very often it's, it's a matter of what's really important for students. Like I've had examples of students that applied to, to dance. And, you know, in truth, they really just, you know, weren't sure that they necessarily wanted to be, have dance as a major, but, you know, they thought, why not? Well, they weren't selected for dance, but they still had their heart coming to Florida State. And so we're able then to take another look at it to say, yeah, you, you know, you do meet our, our acceptance profile. However, you're not going to be a dancer at Florida State as a major, so what are you really wanting to do? I think academic advising is hugely important, and it's one of those things that FSU does very, very well, and so matching students up with their advisor at the time of orientation, knowing that they get advising you know, at any time that they want, I think is very, very important in leading them to being able to graduate in a timely fashion. And, and frankly, um, I think that's why we do have the highest four-year graduation rate in the state of Florida is due to the academic advising uh, that we do at the university. Thank you. I think that is the perfect sentiment to wrap us up with. FSU is the place to come and figure it out. Um, and so, Haga, I want to thank you so much for what you shared with us tonight. You know, I was excited when I saw the slides and this surpassed my expectations. So <laughs> I am so thankful for you being here for with us today. And also, I see that we still have a lot of questions in the Q&A here. Um, admissions.fsu.edu is going to be your place where all things admissions live. So hold those questions and you have Haga's um, information here on screen and there are lots of folks over that office that I know would be happy to help you all out and we are so thankful for your engagement and participation in this topic you know it brings us joy to see all these questions because we know it's something that our alumni are curious about so that's good feedback for us and keep engaging so thank you yeah, and, and I want really, to um, and really just our graduates are the best ambassadors for the university and so you know I, I love it when I travel around in the country and I see people wearing you know FSU gears at, at the airports etc and you can say go Nels and you know it's just that strong bond and um, we want to continue to make sure that we are 
um, engaging with the whole community and, and our graduates are, are so, so important to us. Exactly. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening and being a member of our Alumni Association. Your membership allows us to provide opportunities like this and so many more engagements to come this fall. So keep an eye on your emails, of course, and you can head to alumni.fsu.edu for the full calendar of our fall events. I'd also like to quickly quickly spotlight our Student Alumni Association. I may be a little biased because I advise them, but I think they're the best student organization on campus. And if you do have a student that is coming to FSU soon, I would love for you to check out SAA. Um, both incoming students and upperclassmen have access to leadership opportunities, professional development, and are really networking with each other and building lasting relationships for future success. And with that, I will bid everyone a good evening. Thank you so much for being here and go Knowles.